Welcome everybody, welcome and happy Sabbath. And I'm hoping that your Sabbath is a very restful one um, and, and that you are just basking in the spirit as we wake up to return to the laws, statutes and commandments of the Heavenly Father has given us. And this Sabbath day is one of them, right? In fact, this is a very uh, special union between us and the Heavenly Father. Did you know that the scripture says that the Lord, that the Lord Yahweh did not give the Sabbath to any other people to keep it? But to Israel only. And the Lord said, I have given you my Sabbath. And in, in fact, he said, he says Sabbaths in plural. Which means all the feast days. Right, which are Sabbaths, right? High holy day feast days, which are not the weekly Sabbaths. He said, I have given you my Sabbaths in, in plural as a sign between me and you forever. And the me is Yahweh and the you is Israel and no one else. One of these days also when we continue to do the laws and we're going to study the Sabbath, how to keep the Sabbath, we're going to look into those scriptures and you're going to see clearly that the scripture says that the Lord did not give the Sabbath to any other people but to Israel. The green olive trees and the grafting in, and this is part two. Um, last night we did part one. And the boy, I tell you, the, the post the post recording um, discussion was even more, I would say it was more edifying than the uh, the recorded portion of the of the uh, lesson last night. I'm telling you, it was just beautiful. It was so beautiful. I, I had a great time last night. And boy, I'm hoping that we'll have a great time again today. And I'm hoping, boy, that every time we meet, it will just get better and better. So welcome again. Welcome, everybody, and happy Sabbath. So let me, I'm going to switch screens. Um, I'm going to switch screens. I'm going to go to my Bible screen. Remember, of course, we're going to be talking about Romans the 11th chapter we're going to go we're not going to go line by line because this is so uh, many uh, uh verses in romans 11 we're going to hit the main ones we're going to start actually from <clears throat> um from verse 11 i think because i think that's where yeah from verse 11 because that's where the question came last night which was so um you know engaging so and with that, we just want to say all honor, all praises, and all glory to the Heavenly Father, whose name is Yahweh, in the name of his son, Yahweh Shai. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will be with us today. Grant us your Holy Spirit. Send your angels to be with us, with every family represented here today. Lead us into all truth. Forgive us of our sins. Grant us eternal salvation. And as we always say, Lord, hasten your kingdom, hasten your coming that your name alone will be established throughout all the earth, is our prayer in the name of Yahweh Shai, our Savior. And let the house say, so let it be. So, um, so last night, what we did was, we identified that there are two olive trees. We identified that the Lord referred to Israel as a green olive tree, right? We found that in Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 17. In fact, verses 16 and 17, it says that the Lord, Yahweh, calls thy name a green olive tree, fair and of, and of goodly fruit, and with the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled a fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 11. And what we did last night, we, we established um, that the olive tree is Israel. How do we know that? The next verse, family, the next verse. It says, For Yahweh force that planted thee has pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay? So, it is the Lord that caused this breaking off of the branches of the olive trees. 
And we establish also that it's not only one olive tree, but there are two olive trees. Why are there, uh, why is there two olive trees? Because they represent the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now the Lord did plant one olive tree and that one olive tree was the entire kingdom of Israel. Okay, the nation, the nations of Israel was that green olive tree. And so we, um, sorry, we have that uh, depiction here. Okay, where the green olive tree is the entire house of Israel, all 12 tribes. And why do we say that there are two olive trees? Because the kingdom of Israel split into two. And so now the scripture starts referring to the house of Israel and the house of Judah as two olive trees. Is there any scriptures for that? Yes, we spoke about that last night. We went to Zechariah, the fourth chapter, and we can see Zechariah. Um, in verse, in verse uh, verses two and and three down, it says, "And he said unto me, Who is saying unto who? The angel is saying unto Zechariah, What seest thou? And he said, I look and behold, I look and behold a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees." by it, two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof, right? And so the angels, and, and he says, so I answered and spake unto the angel that spoke, that spoke, um, that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? And then the angel uh, answered and said unto me, no, it's not what these be. The angel is surprised that he didn't know what these were. All right, and then when we jump down to uh, verse 11, it says, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And verse 12 says, And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches which through their golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? He's asking, what are these two olive trees? And they are seen emptying their oil out of their golden pipes into the menorah, because that's what he saw, right? The seven golden candlesticks two olive trees, and the olive trees were emptying their oil into the menorah. And we went back to Leviticus 24 for the answer. Because remember that this is when the Lord established the sanctuary, when he brought Israel into the, into the wilderness, and he established the sanctuary, and and he said in verses 1 and 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. So who is pouring? their oil into the lamp to have the lamp burn continuously. It is the children of Israel. And what are they pouring into the lamp? Because remember, the Israelites had to bring the oil. Right? This is the symbolism. The, the, the children of Israel had to bring the oil to the priests on a continuous basis and pour and the, and the oil has to be poured into the lampstand to keep the menorah bo uh, burning continuously before the Lord. So what Zechariah saw, which is the candlesticks and the olive trees on both sides, 
was the candlestick, which by the way represents Yahweh Shai. We'll talk about that in Revelation in Revelation 1, verse 10, right? That the Lord, that um, John, uh, when he looked behind him, he saw what? The candlestick and one standing in the middle of it who was Yahweh Shai, right? Okay, so this symbolism that we're talking about, the lampstand and the two olive trees, the two olive trees represent the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And they are seen pouring their oil into the lamp. Why? Because the Lord had said to Moses, speak unto the children of Israel and tell them that they should bring pure olive oil to pour into the lampstand to keep it burning continually. So this is what Zechariah is seeing. And why is he seeing this? Because remember, they were going back to the land, coming out of captivity, and they were supposed to build back the temple. And the Lord is saying to them, this is what I am doing. Okay, and these two olive trees represent the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We also said last night, and by the way, we challenge, the, we challenge everybody that says... Um, that the wild olive tree is the pagan nations. We challenge you to show us a scripture that refer to the pagan nations as olive trees or olive tree or as an olive tree or a wild olive tree. Show us that scripture. And it does not exist because in the scriptures, this symbolism, this similitude is used to refer only to the Israelites and none else. So now when we are in Romans, if we have this understanding, when we are in the book of Romans, which is what we're going to talk about today, and we are in chapter 11, which the uh, Christian pastors and Christian church and the Christian members love to run to. They love to run to Paul. But remember we read last night where Peter says that a lot of the things that Paul wrote in his epistles, and, and Romans is one of his epistles, he says a lot of the things that Paul wrote in his epistles are hard to understand. Unless you understand the scriptures, the laws and the prophets, if you don't have a good command of Old Testament scriptures, which by the way, most Christians don't because they only read the New Testament, most, most Christians. You have to have a good command of the Old Testament scriptures to understand what's happening in the New Testament. So Peter says that unless you understand fully the Old Testament scriptures, you are going to misrepresent and misinterpret the epistles of Paul to your own destruction. And as we read Romans 11 today, we'll see that Paul had a perfect understanding according to the wisdom that the Lord gave him of the Old Testament scriptures. And we'll see that Paul is not speaking about the pagan nations. Paul is speaking about the Israelites and their experience as a green olive tree and how that they were torn down, that they split into two kingdoms. They were torn down because the Lord has kindled a fire upon it and the branches are broken off. We're going to see that Paul is talking about the house of Israel as the wild olive tree and the house of Judah as the natural branch. And we're going to also see that the nations of the Gentiles that Paul is speaking about is the northern kingdom of Israel that was um, taken away because of idolatry and that Judah was left alone. And that Judah is the light that the Lord promised King David that he will leave in, in Jerusalem as a light to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles is the nations of Israel, not the pagans. I'm going to see also that the grafting in, after all the branches that were broken off, were grafted back into the root, which is Judah. That all Israel was saved, as it is written. 
All right, so let's get into it. Let's get into it, uh, family. And by the way, remember we say here on this, uh, in this platform that we allow for uh, questions. Uh, um, you can post a scripture or uh, make a comment. We also allow our women to speak because we're a family. And our women on this platform are in perfect order. There's no confusion. Nobody's over talking anybody. And, and our women do not usurp authority over the men. We also say that the men on this platform are the spiritual husbands to these women. Because a lot of these women do not have any husbands to go home and ask any questions to because the husband a lot of times is not is not awakened. Okay? And so we are their spiritual husbands. The men on this platform are the spiritual husbands. And the women can ask questions. And we are in order according to the admonition of Paul and the law. All right. So with that said, feel free, family. Um, we'll accommodate questions and, uh, and your thoughts. All right. So <clears throat> Romans 11. I'm going to bring in a chapter um, at verse 1. Because a lot of times people like to go to verse 11 and they start at 11. Especially the Christians. They never start at verse 1. But in this entire epistle, the context is Israel is not cast away. The entire context of this Romans 11 is that Israel is not cast away. So, Paul says, I say then, has God cast away his people? And he answers the question because it's a rhetorical question. God forbid for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2. Now he's going to make the statement. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. And who are the people that God foreknew? The Israelites. Then he goes on to say, what ye not? What the scripture says of Elias? For that he maketh intercession against God, um, to God against Israel, saying, So who is he making intercession to God against? Israel. So this whole context is about Israel. He went on to say, Lord, they have killed the prophets. Who killed the prophets? Israel. Not the pagan nation. They're not part of this little uh, similitude that Paul is talking about. It's Israel. And they have digged down thine altar, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Verse 4. But what said uh, the answer of Yahweh unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men that have not bowed the knees to the image of Baal. Paul goes on to say, even so then it is, even so then, as this present time also there's a remnant according to the election of grace so what remnant is Paul talking about? The remnant of Israel the remnant of Israel so now when we jump down to verse 11 which is where the question starts he says uh, I say then have they stumbled that they should fall? Who is the they that he's talking about? Let me get my uh, my lesson um, illustration here. The green olive tree is talking about Israel. And this is Israel as, a, as an entire nation together. And then Israel split into the two kingdoms. So we have the kingdom of the house of Judah, the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom, which is the nations or the Gentiles of the house of Israel. And Paul is saying, have they stumbled that they should fall? He says, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the nations for to provoke them to jealousy. And people say, ah, you see, it says salvation has come to the Gentiles, and therefore it's the Gentile nations. It's not. It's not. 
Sorry. Okay. So what we have is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the Lord said, I've kindled a fire upon them. And the branches are broken. So we have all the branches of the northern kingdom of Israel broken off. And we have some of the branches of the southern kingdom of Judah, which is the natural branches, which is the root. Some are broken off, but not all. And how do we know that? Remember that the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity. They were taken out of the, the land and went into Assyria, into captivity, while Judah remained, according to the promise that the Lord made to King David, that I'm going to leave Judah as a light to the nations, because these are the nations of Israel. We established that last night, that the word uh, goy, goyim, in the Hebrew, or ethnos in the Greek, mean, in the Greek sorry, it means nations. And that word applies to Israel. So in the context of this uh, olive tree and the two olive trees, the nations or the Gentiles are the northern kingdom of Israel, which were taken away because of idolatry. And Judah was left. And some of the branches of Judah also was broken off. And Judah eventually went into captivity. Now Paul is saying, have they stumbled? Let's go back to Romans 11. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. Who is it that Paul is saying that have they stumbled that they should fall? That through their fall, salvation should come to the Gentiles. Look, this. This. The house of Judah. The house of Judah stumbled. Why is that? Because when the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. In fact, before the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. When Jeroboam established his idol in Shiloh. And instituted his own feast days. The Levites left the northern kingdom and came back and joined themselves with Judah and Benjamin and forsook the northern kingdom. In fact, um, the Lord said, Ephraim is joined unto idols, let him alone. Who is Ephraim? The northern kingdom, the Gentiles of Israel, the nations of Israel. He said, let him alone. And so the people of the southern kingdom of Israel, the Jews, would have nothing to do with them of the northern kingdom. And they boasted themselves against these people. And these people were taken into captivity. And then Judah fell. So Paul is asking the question, are these people here fallen that they should be um, have they fallen, he says, stumbled and fall. And he said, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. Salvation is come to these. Through the fall of these. Why? Because these here are going to be grafted back into the root. Because remember, the scripture says that the Lord will save Judah first. And that the saving of Judah will result in the reconciliation of the two olive trees. These are the people that Paul is talking about when he says, of this stumble that they should fall, God forbid. But through their fall, salvation has come to these. Let's continue. And there is um, somebody in the chat. Let me grab that. He says, to get a better understanding of the separation of Judah and Israel, 1 Kings chapter uh, 12. Yes. We're going to take a look at that. Thank you so much for that scripture, brother. We're going to take a look at that. All right. So let's continue with Paul. Verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more is their fullness? If the fall of the house of Judah 
be the rich, be the rich, uh, what did he say? If the fall of them be the riches, sorry, of the world. What is the world? The world is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The fall of Judah will bring the riches of the world of Israel. Both northern and southern kingdoms. <clears throat> How much more is their fullness? Paul goes on to say in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles. Now this is not the pagan nation. Paul is speaking to these of the northern kingdom and also those of the southern kingdom who were falling away. Because the house of Judah also experienced a breaking off of the branches. A lot of the Jews that were in the house of Judah went and joined themselves to the pagans. Right? And an example of that, I'm not just talking about it, let's let's look at it. An example of that is this is uh this is first Maccabees, and I'm in chapter six. I'm just gonna read here verse uh verses 21 down. It says, Howbeit certain of them that were besieged got forth. Unto whom some ungodly men of Israel joined themselves. See that? And they went unto the king and said, How long will it be ere thou execute judgment and avenge our brethren? We have been willing to serve thy father. They're talking to, to uh, Jupiter, who is Antiochus' son. He's now king. And they're saying to him that we were willing to serve your father, Antiochus, and to do as he would have us, and to obey his commandments. For which cause they of our nation besiege the tower and are alienated from us. You see, they said, moreover, as many of us as they could light on, they slew and they spoiled our inheritance. So what happened was that the wicked men of Israel joined themselves to the pagans against Israel. Also, we can find this in 1 Maccabees 1, and I think it's about, it's about 40... 40, uh, 43, I think. Let's read it. The scripture says you need at least two witnesses to make a point. And moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. You know, um, this is why you need to have the Apocrypha. Because this is Greek history that is not in your Holy Bible. And so when you see Paul speaking to those of the uncircumcision, you think he's talking to the pagans. He's not talking to the pagans. He's talking to the Jews who were, who were Hellenized under the Greeks, which is not in your Bible. So he said that everyone should leave his laws. Who is the everyone that should leave his laws? And all the heathens agree according to the commandments of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and they sacrificed unto idols and they profaned the Sabbath. Who is doing this? Israelites. Right? And the king had sent letters by, me by messengers unto Jerusalem and to the city of Judah that they should follow the strange laws of the land and that they should forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the temple and that they should profane the Sabbaths and the festivals. Who is doing this? The Israelites. And they polluted the sanctuary and the holy place. All right? Verse, uh, verse uh, let's Let's go on to verse 48. That they should also leave their children uncircumcised. You see that? So now when you see Paul in the New Testament saying that he is the apostle to the uncircumcision, he's not talking about the pagan nations. He's talking about the Israelites who were left uncircumcised under the Greek captivity. And remember, the Greek captivity is the captivity just before the Roman captivity under which Paul um, found himself. But if you don't have this history, you don't know what Paul is talking about. So he said that they should leave their children uncircumcised. Now remember, this happened about 300 years, maybe. Maybe, maybe 250 years before Paul. So for the last 250 years before Paul, a large number of Israelite children were uncircumcised. And they grew up to be men uncircumcised. And they have children. And they're teaching their children the manners of the Greeks. 
Because remember, they have joined themselves to the Greeks, right? So 400 years later, all their children, I mean, 250 years later, all their children are, are acting like Greeks, right? Keeping the feast of Bacchus, all right? Eating pork and worshiping uh, Astoreth, okay? And they make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation to the end that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. That's what you see in the Christian church today. All the ordinances that the Lord gave us were changed to pagan ordinances. And verse 50 says, and whosoever would not do according to the commandments of the king, he said they should die. So what happened is that the Israelites, the Jews, were Hellenized by force. Many of them. But there was a, sorry, there was a remnant of them there was a remnant of them that remained faithful. And that's the reason why you see not all the branches of the house of Judah, which is represented by this olive tree, not all the branches are broken off. So that by the time Christ came, he would have come to see a function in Israel, in the house of Judah. He would have come to see a function in sanctuary in which he was circumcised. And he would have come to see uh, Zachariah, who was John the Baptist's father, administering in the sanctuary. And Caiaphas being high priest. This is how. Because a lot of them resisted. But there are a lot also who were broken off. So Paul is saying that these who fell, fell so that these here could be grafted back in. The contrast says you have to show that the gent what the Gentiles mean different, like you did last night. Okay, yes, we're gonna do that. All right, we're gonna show what the Gentile means. Okay, so let's do that. And Sister Kelly, we will pick up on what you post here in the in the post production. All right. Okay. Awesome. So let us let us do um. What Sister Cantrell asked. Okay, so it says, For I speak to you Gentiles. Who is Paul speaking to? The nations that are fallen off from Israel. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnified my office. Now Paul says this, If by means I may provoke to emulation them that are of my flesh. Stop. Let's go back to it. Remember, Paul is a Jew. Paul is a Jew. He is of the house of Judah. Paul is of the tribe of Benjamin. And Paul is saying here, if he might provoke to emulation them that are of his flesh. He's talking about those that are of the house of Judah. He wants to provoke them to emulation. Right? These ones here that have fallen. That I might save some of them. All right, now let's deal with this word Gentiles. Let's deal with this word Gentiles because a lot of times people think it's talking about the pagan nation, right? Now we established last night that the word goy in the Old Testament, goy, which means Gentiles or which is sometimes translated as nations or heathens is the equivalent word to this word here, ethnos, that is translated in the Greek. So let us first go to the word goy, and we're going we're gonna to go to the first instance in which that word is used in the, in the entire Bible, which is Genesis 10, right? And it says here, this is the word Gentile. This is the first time it's used in the entire scriptures. It says, by these are the eyes of the Gentiles. There's the word, this word, divided, um, divided in their lands, and so on, right? So let us look and see what word that is. And we went into the tool. We did this last night in post-production. And here's the word, the eyes of the Gentiles. And the word is goy, goy, all right? H, 1471. And we look at the meaning of this word, goy. All right, what does it mean? Nation, people, nation and people. Now it says, usually of non-Hebrew people. So it is used usually of the non-Hebrew people. But it is also used for the descendants of Abraham. 
right? So it is used to refer to all the people of the descendants of Abraham. And it is also used for Israel, of Israel. There it is, of Israel. So the word nations or goy, as is used in the scriptures, is not always to the pagan nations. This is similar to the word uh, strangers. Not every, it's not every time that you see the word strangers used, you should conclude automatically that it's talking about the pagan people, as we have established in our, uh, in our video, the two strangers, right? It's, it's the same way. The word goy does not always mean the pagans. It also refers to Israel. So in the context, when the word goy or nations is used, it must be understood whether it be of Israel or of the pagan nations. Now this word goy in the Greek, uh, sorry, this word goy in the Hebrew, this word goy in the Hebrew has its equivalent in the Greek. And so we're going to look at that equivalent in the Greek, okay? So we are back at Romans, because Paul is using the same word. And we are at verse 13, where Paul says, I speak to you Gentiles. So let's see what this word is in the Greek. We're going to open the tool. And here it is. It is G1487. And the word is ethnos. Ethnos. And the definition for ethnos, as is used, is this a multitude whether of men or of beasts or associated or living together it means a company it means a troop or a swarm now ethnos also means uh it's to talk about a swarm um a locust a swarm of locusts or even animals it also means a multitude of individuals of the same nature or genus that means all the Israelites are, uh, are ethnos. They are all Gentiles. All the Israelites of the same ethnos, of the same genus, are ethnos. It also talks about the human family. All the human families are ethnos. It talks about a tribe or a nation or a people or a group. All ethnos. Here also it is used in the Old Testament of foreign nations not worshiping the God or um, pagans or Gentiles, of course. And Paul issues the term to talk to, to, to refer to the Gentile Christians. Right? I remember the Christians are the Israelites. So please, family, when you see the word Gentiles or the word ethnos translated, you have to consider the context. It does not always mean the heathen nations because the word ethnos can also be used to refer to Israel. I'm going to give you another example. Um, my own nation. I'm going to show you that this is the same word. This is, this is Paul in Acts 26. Acts 26 and verse 24. Uh, sorry, and verse 4. Paul says, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. This is the word, nation. And Paul is talking about his manner of life, which was at the first among his own ethnos, amongst his own Gentiles. Let me show you. Let's open it. It says, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nations. There's the word, ethnos. There it is. This is the same word for Gentiles. The same word for nations. Because this word is a generic term. It is not specific to the pagan people. As is believed and taught to us by the cemetery schools. It's false. And you know, on this platform, on this platform, I always emphasize um, context and subject matter. 
which I find um, strange. I find it strange that a lot of people just throw it out the window when you go when they enter into the church building. They throw away context. They throw away subject matter. They they throw away the laws. What we call the laws of concord, which are which are the Lord, which are the laws that govern the language. They just throw them out. Highly educated people just throw it out. All right. And so we have to reestablish that because that's one of the deceptions and one of the strongholds of the enemy. Okay? So this word does not mean automatically the pagan nations. And in the context, in the context of Romans 11, beginning from the very first verse, Paul is not speaking about the pagan nations. He's talking about Israel. He said, as God cast away his people. And Paul is, is using this similitude of the uh, olive trees and is grafting in to prove that, that God has not cast off his people. So when oh, in when, can so I when say we, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, somebody wants to say something. Go ahead, please. Yes, this um with this it's it's control. Okay, go ahead. So it's like um like what we talked about last night. You showed in scripture where the Gentiles well referred to as the, um the tribes of Israel. See, well, a lot of people, including me, <laughs> um, until last night, you know, every time we read Gentiles, we think, you know, it's um the white, the Caucasian people. Yeah. And it's not. Right. 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 And what control is talking about, we looked at Genesis. 35 and 11 last night, where God is talking to Jacob. This is God speaking to Jacob, right? Here it is. God changed his name to Israel, and God is talking to Jacob. And God said unto him, um, in verse uh, verse 9, it says, And God appeared unto Jacob again, right? And uh, verse 10 says, And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And verse 11 says, And God said unto, unto him, I am El, 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 uh, El Almighty, right? El Elyon. And he says, Be fruitful and multiply. And watch this. He says, A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of their loins. Now, remember, these um, the, the Lord is speaking to Jacob concerning the 12 tribe of Israel. And God is saying to him that you're going to have a nation and nations. Now let us look at the word that is used here. And he says, and God said unto him, right, a nation, which is the word goy. You see that? And he says, a company of nations. There's the word goy. A company of nations. The 12 tribes. So when Paul, and Paul knows this, you know. Remember, Paul is a Pharisee, a doctor of the law. Paul knows this. So when Paul is over here in Romans 11, and Paul is talking about the nations, the, the Goyims, or the ethnos, he's talking about the ethnos of Israel. Right? And he said that these fall that it shall bring in the fullness of these, the Gentiles, the nations of Israel. All right? So, this word does not only and always refer to the pagan nations. Right? I think we also looked at, um, I think Brother, um, Brother Mel had brought to us, I think it was uh, Matthew 4. I think it was Matthew 4 right here. Right here. Matthew 4 and verse 13, where it says, And leaving Nazareth, he came to Capernaum. And leaving Nazareth, Yahawashai came to Capernaum, which is up on the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Why? Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Elijah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, is Galilee of the Gentiles. Hold on. Is Zebulun and Naphtali Gentiles? No. 
No. And when we go to Isaiah, of which this is, uh, which is precept to this, when we go to Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah the ninth chapter. Let's see. I think that's where we were. Isaiah 9. There it is. Isaiah 9 and verse 1. It talks about Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. This is what Matthew is quoting. That, that Yahweh went to Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill Isaiah 9 and 1. And it says, and afterwards did more grievously afflicted her by way of the sea, by Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Galilee of the nations. So this proves that the translation, Galilee of the nations, was translated in Matthew, the fourth chapter. Galilee of the nations was translated as Galilee of the Gentiles. But in the Old Testament, it was Galilee of the nations, proving that the word ethnos in the Greek is the equivalent of boy in the Hebrew, and in both cases are in reference to Israel because Napsali and Zebulun is not the pagans. But but you say the block. They are not the pagans. We are here. Paul is talking about him being the apostles to the nations, the other nations of Israel. Why? Because Peter is the apostle to the circumcision. Who are the circumcision that Peter is the apostle to? These are of the Jews, these here branches that never fell off. And Paul is the apostle to these here of the house of Judah that fell off under Hellenization and also the nations of Israel scattered abroad. The Gentiles of Israel scattered abroad. This is what Paul is talking about. So we continue. So Paul is saying, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. What is the first fruit that is holy? The house of Judah. Because remember, the Lord said he's going to leave Judah as the root to bring the nations back together as one. This is what Paul is talking about. So Paul says, for if the first fruit be holy, then the lump is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. He's talking about the house of Judah. Okay? Let's continue. Now, if some of the branches be broken off, Jeremiah 11, if some of the branches be broken off, you see them here of the house of Judah? <coughs> Excuse me. This is what Paul is talking about. If some of these branches be broken off, because remember, this nation of Israel is already gone. So Paul is saying, if some of these branches here be broken off, And though, being a wild olive tree, these here, were grafted in among them, were grafted in among these, And with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. This, the house of Judah. And the tribe of Judah in particular. Why? Because remember, Yahweh came to the tribe of Judah in particular. Which is the promise that God made to David. When he says, I'm going to leave Judah as a light. That through Judah, all the other nations, all his children shall be blessed, right? Okay, that's what the Lord said to David. Okay, so now this is what Paul is talking about. He says, if you are one of these and you're grafted back into Judah, he says, boast not against the branches. Let's go back to it. Boast not against these here, nor against any of these. 
Why? But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If you are of any of the tribes of the northern kingdom, and you are grafted back into Judah, which is the root, boast not yourself against anybody of Judah, because Judah bear you. You are by faith. You came back into, uh, into the commonwealth of Israel through Judah, through the light of the house of Judah and the tribe of Judah in particular, which God said he would leave in Israel to bring all the nations back. So he's saying, boast not against them because they bear you. Thou will say, the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Yes, you are going to say, these branches here of the house of Judah are broken off that you of the northern kingdom might be grafted in. You Gentiles, you nations of the northern kingdom, you're going to be grafted back into the house of, of Judah in order to be saved. Let's continue. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Yes, because of unbelief, these here of the house of Judah, which was left, were broken off. When were they broken off? Remember, we just read in the Hellenization in the time of the um, Antiochus and the Greeks that a lot of these people were broken off of the house of Judah. He says, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, these, if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee, you who are grafted back in. Take heed. Let's continue. Behold, behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but towards thee. Goodness. If thou, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. What is saying to thee that are grafted back in? You better not be high-minded, but have faith. Because the Lord will cut you off again. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, let's go back to it. If these here abide still not in unbelief, that means they are converted. If they are converted and they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. These here, the of Judah that are broken up, they shall be grafted back in. Watch. For God is able to graft them in again. No. You cannot be grafted in again unless you were already part of the tree in the first place. You cannot be grafted in again. And this again that, the, that he's talking about is not of these nations because they were never part of Judah in the first place. These nations of the nations of the northern kingdom of Israel cannot be grafted in again into the root, which is Judah, because they were never part of Judah in the first place. So the people that Paul is talking about, that they will be able to be grafted back in again, are the people of the house of Judah that fell also. Watch. And this is why I say context and subject matter. You cannot be reconciled to a husband that you never had the first time. We talk about that, right? You can't be reconciled to a man that you never had before. So this idea that the pagan nations are grafted in again don't, doesn't make any sense. They cannot be, they could not never be grafted in again in the first place because they were never there in the first place. So the only people that can be grafted in again are those that were there. And because this is talking about the house of Judah, the people that are grafted in again into this root are the Jews who fell apart, who fell away. Let's continue. And I see in the chat, I'm going to get the, the comment board in a minute. For if thou wert were cut out of uh, the olive tree, which is wild by nature, 
these and were grafted in contrary to nature into the good olive tree, this How much more shall these, these were broken off of Judah, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, watch that, be grafted into their own olive tree? See? Sorry. These, these here, right? If you can be grafted back, back if you can be grafted into the natural branches, how much more shall these who are the natural branches be granted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you be ignorant of the mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the other nations of Israel shall come in. Why? Why? And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. So this scenario of the broken off branches of the two olive trees and the natural branches that are grafted into their own olive tree and the branches of the northern kingdom of Israel that were totally gone that can be grafted back in is for one purpose. What is the purpose? Verse 26, that all Israel shall be saved as it, as it is written. What is written, Lord? That there shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is what this entire similitude of the grafting in is all about. That they all might come back to be one good olive tree with all the tribes to become one kingdom. Because it says that as a result of all this, all Israel shall be saved as it is written. And now Paul is quoting the Old Testament. Right? What is Paul quoting? What is Paul quoting? Isaiah. Is it Isaiah? Yeah, sorry. Isaiah 59. Paul is quoting Isaiah 59 and verses 19 and 20. Verses are, uh, 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 I think it's 20 and 21. He says, And a redeemer shall come to Zion. This is Isaiah. The Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith Yahweh. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith Yahweh. My spirit shall be upon thee, and my words which I put into thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed. There's no pagan. As Yahweh, as says Yahweh, from henceforth and forever. This is what Paul is preaching in the grafting in, in Romans 11. Watch. That's what he just says here. That all Israel might be saved, as it is written. Where is it written? Isaiah 59, verses, 19, verses 20 and 21. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer. And shall turn away ungodliness from Israel. Jacob is Israel. Verses 27. Verse 27. For this is my covenant with them. And I shall take away their sins. Okay. So this gospel of the grafting in. Pertains to Israel in its context. And that the good olive tree. And the wild, wild olive tree. Refer to the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not to the Jews and the pagans. No. No, because there is no precept established in the scriptures um, for that idea. 
All right, the precept in the scriptures concerning the olive trees pertains only to Israel. The two trees, one is a wild tree and the other one is the natural branch. Who is the wild tree? The, the northern kingdom of Israel. Who is the natural branch? Judah. Who is grafted back in? All of them of the northern kingdom of Israel who went into idolatry, went astray, and were cut off from the commonwealth of Israel, they can be grafted back in through Judah. And all them of Judah who were Hellenized under the Hellenization and who fell away can also be grafted into their own olive tree. For God is able to graft them in again into their own olive tree. All right, let's take a number of items in the chat. Let's see. I don't remember where I stopped the last time. Right, let me try to scroll back up. And it's very difficult for me to navigate this chat. All right, it says, um, Robin Kelly says, sure things, no worry, brother. All right, okay. Uh, it says, Gentile strangers, foreigners, and sojourners. Um, Yashan, Yashan is asking me, um, and the answer to that is yes, the Gentiles and the strangers that, and, and the Israelites, foreigners, are the same. Yes. Right? And they are also the sojourners that the scripture says can participate and be uh, and benefit from the promises of Israel. Yes, we're not talking about the pagan people. All right. Um, so I think Robin Kelly says, yes, yes, on. Thank you so much, Robin. He says, we are all those. Yes, she says, assembled together as strangers and travelers, um, meeting here in the Zoom as brothers and sisters on the Sabbath in the kingdom of heaven through our Yahamashiach. Yes. All praises. I'm, I'm telling you, this sister is on fire. Okay, so don't forget about the dry bones. Thank you so much, Sister Cantola. That's where, that's where I'm going to go next, right? Okay. Um, it says, all praises to the most high. This is Brother um, Yasun says that. Yasun D. All praises. Oh boy, this is great to see everybody being edified here today. And it says, how is Paul speaking to the northern kingdom when they are in Aseret at that time? Somebody, this is a great question, Brother. Uh, hallelujah. Um, uh, at the time when Paul was preaching. All right, okay, we're going to talk about that. How is he talking up to the northern kingdom when they were already in Aseret? And we say that Aseret is, is sub-Sahara Africa, where never mankind dwelt. All right, great question. We talked about that last night, though, in the post-recording. Um, um, brother brother um, uh, Molenga says, Matthew 10.4, one of the disciples was a Canaan that night. Or do you clarify that? Okay, that, that's easy. Um, uh, and then Brother Yasha give us a thumbs up. So let me see. I think I'm caught up. No, um, Marie, Sister Marie says there is something I've noticed in the scriptures with the word nation and the word the nations and all nations. Um, is it safe to conclude that the nations is Israel and all um, and all nations refer to the other people? Not necessarily. No, uh, not necessarily. And we can look at that, right? Because the nations, um, Sister Marie, the nations are these also of Israel. All right, because remember, the Lord said to Jacob, a company of nations shall come out of thee. So when you are in the southern kingdom of Judah and you're speaking about the nations, you're talking about the northern kingdom of Israel, where salvation, um, you know, where it pertains to salvation. So you will see even prophets in Israel, in the southern kingdom, talking about the nations that are abroad. About the nations that are scattered amongst the isles. They are talking about these year of Israel. Because Israel is the scattered people. And you will see the that, nations. Go that ahead. was um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was a that was a scripture we looked at also last night that um it referred to us as well, yeah, the Israelites as being Gentiles at one point. Yeah. 
Yeah, we looked at, we looked at, <clears throat> yes, let's, let's get that. Let's get that. Thank you so much, sister. I think that's Sister Cantrell. Thank you so much for that. And, and you see, family, how the women are an important part of this ministry. And our women are allowed to speak in order. All right, in order. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. All right. Um, I'm going to get that, Sister Cantrell. Uh, so, I think she, I think she had asked another question. Let me go back to, to, um, uh, who was it? Sister Marie, was it Sister Marie? Oh yeah, she says, it's safe to conclude that the nation, oh, okay, no, so not always, in the same way that Goy does not always refer to the pagans, but also refers to the descendants of Abraham and also Israel. So it, so it is also with the nations and nations and all nations. It depends on the context. It depends on the context. All right. Um, and also the same thing is with strangers. You know, there are the strangers of Israel born abroad and they are strangers. And that there is the strangers that are the other people of the um, heathen nations. It's not talking about them, but it's a different stranger. All right, and um, and also and also, Sister Marie, if you're still there, there is also the word world, world, world. In fact, Paul used that word in this Romans 11, where it says the reconciling of the world. What world is he talking about? The world of Israel, the reconciling of the northern and the southern kingdom being one, and that takes me to the dry bones, the dry bones. Um, okay, there's a about, somebody wants to make a comment about the world. Um, oh, as I was okay. going to comment on that in the context in which it was used just now, um, in Romans 11, Paul is clearly talking about Israel, and so for God so loved the world, it's the same context, yes, that He gave, yes, His only belief, yes, the John 3 16 that people like to go to to include everybody, right, but in context, just like Romans 11. Right. It's talking right. about Israel. Right. In Romans 11. Thank you so much, sister. Um, in Romans 11, Paul is talking about the reconciling of the world of Israel. Yes, verse 15. Verse, well, it's verse, it might be in verse 15 also. Yes, but in verse, uh, verse 12 as well, it says, No, if the fallen of them be the riches of the world. And in verse 15, it says, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. What? What reconciling of the world? Remember the word reconciling? This cannot be the pagan nations reconciling. Because the, the pagan nations cannot reconcile to Israel because they were never a part of Israel before. Family, let's remember this. Let's remember context. Let's remember subject matter. And let's keep in mind the laws of concord. In all the languages, let's remember it. You cannot reconcile the pagans to the Israelites. It's impossible because the word reconcile means to come back together again. Right? You cannot come back to the husband that you never divorced in the first place. You can only reconcile back to the husband that you divorced or that you separated from. And the, and the gospel of reconciliation is made and given to Israel in the form of the marriage. We're going to talk about that in another lesson. Because we are married to the Lord. The Israelites are the only nations referred to as being married to the Lord. And the only people that the Lord, that the scripture said the Lord gave them a bill of divorcement. Did you know that? That the Lord gave Israelite, uh, Israel a bill of divorcement? And drove her out as an unfaithful wife. But in the marriage arrangement is reconciliation. Did you know that? That is why Paul says, if she depart from her husband, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled again to her husband. That's in the law. That is in the law. So this reconciliation that the scriptures is talking about 
the, uh, Paul said that the, that the Lord Yahweh gave us the gospel of reconciliation. That Israel can be reconciled to him, being his wife. And in the Revelation where it talks about, come and let me show you the, the, the bride's wife. Who do you think it's talking about? Israel. Right? That's another lesson. We're going to go into that, those lessons also to prove that there are many uh, similitudes. There are many similitudes in the scriptures, many parables in the scriptures that are used to demonstrate the relationship between Yahweh and Israel. Which, is, which are specific to Israel and does not include the other nations. And certain words, like for example, reconcile. This reconciling of the world cannot be the reconciling of the pagan nations to Israel because it never happened and they were never together in the first place. So it has got to be the reconciling of these two kingdoms, of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Israel, to become one. And then that leads us to, and I and I've not forgotten you um what you what you asked me, Contrell, but that leads us to the dry bones. The dry bones, Ezekiel 37. Right? We talked about that last night. It, it says here the reunion of Israel and Judah. Do you know that this word reunion means the reconciliation? The reconciliation of Judah and Israel. Do you know that there is no subject anywhere in any scripture that talks about the reunion of Israel and the pagan nations? There's no reunion anywhere in the scriptures of the Jews and the pagan nations. It does not exist. Only the reunion of Yahweh and Israel and the reunion of the two um, houses of Israel. That's it. Moreover, son of man, in verse 16, take unto thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companion. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. There it is. This is Judah and the children of Israel, his companion, Benjamin and Levi. Get a stick and write upon it, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Okay? And then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, which is the stick of Ephraim, for all the house of Israel, his companions. Let us look at it. This is them. The northern kingdom of Israel is referred to as Joseph. Or Ephraim. And who are his companions? Reuben, Simeon, Dan, Manasseh, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, and Ephraim, and the Levites that are among them. This is the house of Israel and his companions. And by the way, I'm emphasizing at this point Dan. I'm emphasizing Dan. Because Dan is with the half-tribe of Manasseh. All right. And Ezekiel 37. And you're going to do what? Join them one to another into one stick. And they shall become one in thine hand. You see them two sticks? That's them. You see that olive tree and that one? That's them. Okay? And when the children of that people shall say unto thee, saying, Will thou not show us what thou meanest by these? You shall say unto them, verse 19, Thus saith Yahweh power, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim. Please understand, family, that Joseph and Ephraim are used interchangeably. For all the tribes of Israel is fellows. There it is. There it is. And I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah. And this is the reconciliation family. And make them one stick. 
and there shall be one in thine hand. Let's continue. So you're going to see that this is the essence of the grafting in. And the stick whereupon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thou said Yahweh power, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from amongst the heathen. What? There ain't no heathens coming in here. This grafting in does not include any heathen. And this is the reason why Peter says, you better know the scriptures to understand what Paul is talking about. Because half of Christianity have never read Ezekiel 37. They don't even know what it's about. There are no spiritual Jews here. It says, you shall say unto them, I will take the children of Israel from amongst the heathen. The Christian church was never scattered amongst the heathen. It says, whether they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. The Christian church is out. The Christian church was never in Jerusalem. <clears throat> the, the Anglican church was not never there. The Seventh-day Adventist church was never there. Nor the Baptists or any other of them churches. All right. And I will make them one nation. There it is. The one Goy. The one Ethnos. Same word. The one Gentile. Same word. And I will make them one nation in the, in the, uh, upon the mountain of Israel. And one king shall be king of them all. And there shall be no more two boys. There shall be no more two Gentiles. Why is that? Because this is the problem. They were split. This is the two nations. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You want me to prove it? Watch. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. There it is. This is the two kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. This is the grafting in. Let's finish it up, family. Neither shall they defile themselves with their detestable things, nor any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be Yahweh their God. And we can read the rest of it. And I'm going to. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. Remember the Lord said to David that I'm going to leave a light for you. And I'm going to establish my kingdom with you. <clears throat> and they shall have one shepherd, Yahweh Shia, Mashiach. And they shall also walk in my judgment. The laws are not done away with. And they shall observe my statutes and do them in the kingdom. This is why we're waking up. And repenting. Returning. Who is returning? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. Remember I did my lesson on the repentance, repentance. Right? To the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Verse 25. And they shall dwell in the land. Which land? Which I have given to Jacob, my servant. Christian church out again. Wherein your fathers have dwelt. Christian church out again. And they shall dwell therein. Even they and their seed. And their seed, seed. Forever. Forever. And my servant David shall be prince over them. Forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace. New covenant. And it shall be a whole long everlasting covenant with them. Who is the them? The house of Israel and the house of Judah. And I will, and, and it will be, um, and I will place them, sorry, and multiply them. And they say, oh, there's not going to be any um, sex in the kingdom. Wrong. And I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. And my tabernacles, this is the feast of the tabernacles. And my tabernacles um, also shall be with them, yea, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know, there's the heathen. There's the heathen. And the heathen shall know that I, Yahweh, 
do who sanctify who? Israel. When my sanctuary is in the midst of them forevermore. This is the grafting in. This is what Paul is talking about. That shall result in this year. Fulfilling the promises that God made to Israel. And family, I'm going to go on a pause. Do not go anywhere. I'm just going to be one minute. All right, that was 45 seconds. All right, so let's continue. At this point, let me get caught up in the chat, please. <clears throat> Isaiah 45, 17, Brother Mel, thank you so much. You know what Isaiah 45, 17 says? Let's get it, family. Let's get it. Let's get it. Isaiah 45, now remember, you know, that the scripture says to the law and to the prophets, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to it, there's no light in them. You have to go show me in the testament, in, in the testimony or in the law that the wild olive tree is the pagan nation. Show me. It doesn't exist. The two olive trees are the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Right. And in fact, um, it is though that olive tree that became a wild branch. We talked about that last night. We're going to look at that scripture again. But we have to get out of, um, Isaiah 45 and verse 17. Because when we talk about the world, I think that's where Brother Mel is going with this. It says, Israel shall be saved. Watch this family. Israel shall be saved in Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. Something is over my screen. Sorry. Ye shall not be ashamed or confounded World without end. Who is it talking about? Israel, subject matter of the birth of the birth. Remember, family, this is the subject matter. Israel. So who is the world? It's not the pagan nations. It's the reconciliation of the world of Israel that shall be saved. It's not a strange idea, and Paul is very aware of it. Yahweh also is very aware of it. That is why when he was speaking with Nicodemus in, in John 3, 16, he said, for God so loved the world. He's talking about the Israelites. Right? These two rabbis, these two top um, Jews were talking about salvation for Israel. And the one Jew said to the other Jew, how shall a man be saved? The man that you're talking about is not, pag is not pagans. So. Go ahead. Do you think, uh, I always wondered if John 3.16, to be honest with you, I always thought that the pagan Catholics wanted to change that and include everybody so bad that I really honestly believe that it truly says for Yahweh so loved Israel instead of the world. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? I always had that thought. The Holy Spirit has brought that thought to me many times. And, and many wow. times, many times, brother, many times I um, endeavored to say it even in my messages, in, in my videos, you know. And you know why I've, I've constrained myself? Because people are going to say, oh, you're adding to the word. But the Holy Spirit had already said to me a long time ago that that's what was there. Yes. Yes, I'm so happy to hear you say that. I, I really am. <laughs> because I told my wife the same thing. I said, 
I said, I, I, it just don't, it just don't, it, it just don't fit. I said, it just don't I, fit. I, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, Thank brother. You. Yes. All praises, all praises. Thank you so much for that. Yes. I really, really, truly believe it. All right. No, am I preaching that as a gospel? I'm not. I'm telling you that by the spirit, and I believe that what this brother is saying also, by the spirit. When you when you when you um when you read John 3 16, and we're gonna do a lesson on John 3 16 also, because you know Yahweh Shai said to Nicodemus, Art thou a prophet in Israel? And not a prophet, he said, Art thou a teacher in Israel and know not these things? They were not talking about the pagan people, they were talking about Israel. And 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 um and I believe Nicodemus uh, because this is what Yahweh Shai was quoting. So so he's asking him, how shall Israel be saved with an everlasting salvation? This is what Yahweh is talking about, that Israel shall be saved with an everlasting life. And that's what I believe. Right? He also talks about as Moses held up the serpent in the wilderness. Who was in the wilderness for the, Moses, the Israelites? I remember the scripture clearly says that the, that the serpents bit the Israelites and that they died. And, 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 and Yahweh is saying, in the same way I'm going to be lifted up and if you, Israel, look to me, you should, you're going to be saved. As in the wilderness. So this conversation in context is concerning Israel and their salvation. And I believe, brother, like, like what you said, with all my heart. By the Spirit. All right, great point. Thank you so much. Great point. All right, next thing, um, uh, Sister Robin says... Uh, take women out of the Bible. And <laughs> oh, praises. She said, take women out of the Bible. There will be nothing left. And that is true. That is so true. All right? She said, take Queen Esther. Take her out and see what happens. There will be no Jews. <laughs> oh, praises, sister. Thank you so much for that. All oh, praises. You see why our sisters are necessary? Okay. Somebody, our brother Yashan, uh, Yashan says, yes. All oh, praises. Okay, and I think I'm caught up with the chat. And now, Sister Cantrell, um, I forgot your question. What did Sister Cantrell ask us to do again? Um, the the dry bones. Oh, well, we, we just did it. Yeah, we just gonna close it on that note. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So that's it. So we we closed out on the dry bones, right? We just did it. Um, Ezekiel thirty seven is the fulfillment. Or uh, is the prophecy of the grafting in into one. That is it. It's the two sticks coming together as one. Okay. And we have, by the way, I've, I've flipped on this many times. This is our two sticks. Now, they were, I did a response video to um, JMS that came up against this, right? I did a response video to it. And since then, I've not heard anything back, right? And the reason is that this is our chart that we are bringing to the world to include all the people that have been scattered to this diaspora. Of the two sticks, and I remember I said that you can, there can be no one stick. There, I mean, there can be no one, uh, one only chart. Because you can't take this one only chart to everywhere. It doesn't apply to everybody. So we are saying that this is our two sticks. Two sticks. This is our Ezekiel 37. Right? And we are including all the tribes of the northern kingdom because we believe that the tribes of the northern kingdom left Assyria, went back over the Euphrates, and went into sub Saharan Africa where never mankind dwelt, according to 2nd Ezra chapter 13. That is what we say. Um, and so we say that the sub Saharan West African. Native Bantu people from the Gambia to the Cameroon are Israel. We say also that the sub saharan Central African uh, native Bantu people, and by the way, we did our Bantu lessons. You can go back and do uh, and listen to our Bantu um, our videos and our African videos right, where we went into the research to prove this. All right. Um, we said sub saharan Central African native Bantu people from, from the Central African Republic to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all the way to Somalia, there are Israelites there. We say that the Sub-Saharan South African native Bantu people from the Angola to Mozambique and to Zimbabwe 
all the way to South Africa are Israel. We talk about um, the uh, Israelites in the Middle East, just the Israelites in the Middle East. Right? We talk about the Afro Asian people. Right? The Afro Asian people from India to China. And we talk about all the people of this uh, people mixed up amongst the whole world is Israel. And then we talk about Judah. This is our stick of the kingdom of Judah. And we are saying that some sub-Sahara, West African, native Igbo people and Yoruba people that were the residue of the people that were left in, in, uh, in, in Africa after from the, sub, um, from the transatlantic slave trade, from the Gambia to the Cameroon, are of the house of Judah. And we are saying that they are still there. And we are trying to wake them up. We are hailing our brothers and sisters in the mainland of Africa to wake up, to repent and return to the Heavenly Father that we might come out from under this bondage. We also said that Judah includes the North Americans, the African Americans, and the Afro-Canadians, Afro and the African American people. Right? We're not excluding them. We're, we also said that Judah, the house of Judah, includes the Central and South American from Mexico all the way to Argentina. We're not excluding them. Right? And we are including the Afro people in those areas. Because one of the things I noticed that in these in this quick, quick, cookie cutter charts that exist, they leave out the Afro people in these areas. And they see the and they see the descendants of the conquistadors and say, Oh yeah, you are you're Issachar, you're Issachar, right? And they completely um forget that they are Afro people, the original people that came over on the slave ship that went to South America, are still there in the backwoods. I think it wasn't until 2020 that many of those people even made it into the census in those South American countries. They are Israel. Well, for um for some of us that still might be confused, that um that scripture, I don't remember which one it was, referring to us as the Gentiles, the okay. Israelites. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you did say that. That was your next thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do it. We're going to do it. That's clarity right there. Okay, good. All right, we're going to do it. Um, we also say, we also say as part of the house of Judah, as part of the house of Judah, we say that the Caribbean islands from the Afro-Cubans all the way to the Afro-Trinidadians, uh, we say are the house of Judah. We also say that the Afro-Europeans, because remember also that this, the ships went to Europe. People in England and in Northern Ireland and people in, in, uh, in, in, in Spain and in Scotland are Israel. Scattered. Judah is scattered to the four corners. So you can't have a chart that talks about the Americas only. This is why we make this chart. Are we saying that chart should not be used? No, we're not saying that. We're just saying, let's leave us with our chart because our chart is in, including the people that we are focused on. And it's not wrong. And then we talk about Judah being the mixed people of this, this descent, of this diaspora worldwide. Worldwide, we're not leaving on anybody. If you are from the diaspora, of the house of Judah, if you came out of West Africa, if your family leads back to those people, you are Israel. Right? And this grafting in is for you to wake up, to repent, to return, to reconcile, to be adapted. That's the next lesson we're going to do on the adoption. All right. I will add all praises, all honor, and all glory to the Heavenly Father, whose name is Yahweh, and His Son, whose name is Yahweh Shai. And until next lesson, Shalom, shalom, and